Are we live? I think we are. Are we live, Eric? Live. Eric says we're live. Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm sitting here with a rather wonderful Mr. 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 Yes, Mr. Math yes. Matthew Weiss. How are you, my friend? Matthew Weiss. Ugh. I'm doing well, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I was just thinking, where's my, where's my, I've got, I've got, a, it's actually a cricket cap. It's not a baseball cap, but I could go and get it on and turn it back to front. Right on. Me. Yeah. Nobody, but nobody would believe me. Wait, wait, what was that dance? I don't know. That was me. That was my, my bad dancing. <laughs> I, I embarrass. I have a seven-year-old daughter. I embarrass her every single day. As you I, should. Yes, as I should. You know, I like. I, I pick her up. I, I am blessed to have a car that the roof comes down on. I pick. My wife was away for three days, so I was picking her up from school um, the last three days, and I pull up. And I'd play music, and and I, we took her to see Dua Lipa for a first ever show at seven, which honestly is amazing. It's a really good show. No light show, no lasers, no big screens, just people dancing and singing for a, for a kids. It was so much fun, and it was live singing. You know the oh. I know the sound man because I'd worked with him with Sam Smith, and he's a brilliant sound man. And and uh, yeah, it was just a great great show. But anyway, so I pull up in the car with Dua Lipa playing. Which is she likes, but she's also completely embarrassed of me. <laughs> All right, well that's my introduction. How's your day been? <laughs> yeah, I've I've been sort of doing a lot of back to back sessions, so my throat's a little scratchy and I'm a little tired, but I'm good and just, you know, keeping it grinding. What have you what what are you working on at the moment? So I had Khan show up. And we booked out a week. He's got an Afrobeat artist and he's got a rapper out of Atlanta. So we're working on their projects. And then he's got a couple of spots that he's doing uh, some little singles and things like that. So it's mostly nice. that. Yep. And then a couple couple independent clients booked me as well. So, you, have to be you're, so you're keeping uh, super, super busy. I'm bringing up the chat here so I can see what people are, are chatting about. So you're um, keeping incredibly busy. Yeah, this this month I got a uh, I got pretty fortunate and I'm I'm pretty much booked out till uh, mid whatever month comes after this one. <laughs> so, what know. month are we in at the moment, everybody? Yeah, I you know there was a time I was in Miami with Con and we were cutting a Spanish album and it was just me and Con in the studio and he he said yeah hold on a second stop the track and then he just looks at me he goes. What month is it? And I look back at him. I had to really think about it for a second. I was like, August. And it was. So oh, I thought you were going to say, actually, it was July. I wasn't sure, though. I actually I thought it might. I wasn't sure if it was July or August. Uh, that's the kind of that's the world that I'm living in. Ah, uh, uh. well, who do we have in the chat? We have Chris, Jelly Moon, Don. Don says, I have seven kids. Wow. And it's been my pleasure to embarrass all of them at one time or another. I'm That's glad to see I, I couldn't embarrass that many people if I tried. No, I probably could. But Hey, we've got a few hundred people watching now. We could embarrass ourselves in front of all of them. Well, embarrassing myself, <laughs> that's easy. Anybody can embarrass themselves. I do that all the time. <laughs> but embarrassing somebody else takes a special skill. Ah, Mika says, uh, hello from Bavaria. We get to steer. Um, Hervig says, hello, Jacob. Hello, CJ. Um, tons of wonderful people here. Chris Coral. Um, well, so you put out a course with ProMix Academy. On I sure mixing did. With emotion. It's pretty intense, I must say. I don't think I know anybody that's actually put it in those terms i think one of the things that you and i probably get asked all the time you've been doing it you know um education stuff even longer than myself is everybody talks about that the the how all the time don't they everybody was like it's almost like these days you know start a new youtube channel because you can watch 10 videos on how to do something and then create your own trust me i've seen my videos redone a hundred times over now it's uh, five tips you know <laughs> And I get it, but the how is great. This is how you make something better. But the why is really the most important thing because 
you, you know, there's a lot of discussion about music sounding super generic. And I think that's got a lot to do with the fact that we're all learning the same techniques. It, it's really super important to know why are we doing this? And I think emotion really talking about mixing with emotion solves that problem in such a massive way for me because you listen to the song on a global thing and like well what am i trying to do here what am i trying to say what am i trying to what what emotions am i trying to bring out so what is your thought process behind this what when you approach a song and somebody gives you something to mix or produce or combination of the both i mean okay i'm asking a question now which probably has a five-hour answer but you know what what starting point do you have hey how about that yes no, <laughs> <just kidding>. um, <laughs> yes <laughs> basically you know it, when you're on the engineering side of things and on the production side of things there's you know especially with engineering it's very heavily technical world uh, but artists and musicians and fans don't listen with the with the ideas of envelope and frequency curve in mind nobody's ever put a song into those terms the, what they're hearing is is what they're trying to express and so you know an artist will hear something wrong with their performance a thousand times faster than they hear something wrong with the top end or the bass so you know for my starting point it's it's trying to understand what the record is what's the idea of the record usually there are clues that make it clear but sometimes even just to ask to say like you know what's important in this record what are you trying to do with it maybe there's some lyrics that might help along with that things like that and so from there i can kind of get into that frame and for me the the biggest part of the process is learning how to enjoy the record a lot of the times i'll get a record that i don't necessarily like i would say that happens pretty frequently but I, I want to be able to like the record so I can appreciate what I enjoy about the record. And if I can find myself in that mindset, then I can keep highlighting the things that are giving me that enjoyment and ultimately, you know, create a better listening experience for the end listener. That makes perfect sense. I, the, what you first started off saying uh, was really super, super important. I mean, it was all important, but that one line is like, an artist will hear, hear something wrong in their performance much quicker than they will hear anything else. Like any, and somebody else, as Chris Coral just pointed out, is like it's easy to teach technical. It is. It's it very is. easy to teach boost and cut and all all this kind of stuff. But it's and it's great to be armed with all of the technical ability. So please go ahead and learn everything you possibly can. But then you have to know when to use them. And it's, and also you know a lot of the technical stuff i can teach what fre frequency masking is in under 10 seconds i can teach you how to listen for it and how to work around it in you know maybe a day two days but you know a lot of it comes down to what you as the person learning can apply to your monitoring situation and your ability to hear so there's only so much that a youtube video can ever even do for the technical side of things but once you get the technical side of things down there really isn't too much more explaining that needs to be done so uh, ferdinando asks a question i think is it is asked by lots of people very very frequently it says after viewing matt's video i have a question shouldn't this type of artistic and emotional decision be decided already in the production phase before mixing and I feel like the answer is, of course, I mean, get everything right at the beginning. But yeah. the reality is the is, beginning, beginning. Yeah, I like it. I like it when the vision for the song starts at the same phase as the writing phase. When people actually start writing the whole concept of the song production into the lyrics and into the, the framing and the arrangement before you even like in pre-production, that's pre-production and it's a thing. <laughs> so yes absolutely it should be decided as early as possible yeah yeah but i suppose a lot of other things that questions that came up uh around around your video was how much of this do you do in conjunction with the artist and all the producer sometimes the same person obviously the producer is the artist and how much of this is you deciding what you think is best because they hired you to do the best job and then presenting it to them. That's uh, so here's the thing. 
when you get into the the realm of professional engineering and production, you're going to get turned down a lot. You're going to get hired a lot and you're going to get turned down a lot. And what's going to happen is the people who hire you will swear to God that you are music Jesus. And the people who don't like you will say, I hired this professional person and I paid so much and I didn't get results I liked. And the answer is because your individualism starts to come out. And when people are hiring you for you, you know, you try to make the initial communication very strong where you try to understand what they're looking for, but at the same time that they understand what you do. And so, you know, I can, I can always tell when I'm not going to, it's not going to work out. Like if I'm getting notes, sometimes people will send me notes before I even start working on the record, like a PDF that has notes or some shit. That's not going to go well. It's never going to go well. Um, so yeah, it, you, you ultimately, you do start taking a, a risk about losing potential clients when you start imparting your own individual artistic expression onto theirs. Um, but that's part of art you are you are an artist and your art is not going to please everyone and you have to be okay with that otherwise you're just always going to be in the middle of the road doing a job that somebody else can also do yeah yeah very very true you know i just finished an ep um with an artist and um we chose pete lyman to master it um which is the perfect choice for this particular genre it was a little a little kind of 70s and retro, very performance-based. Not that, obviously, a million other great mastering engineers couldn't have done it, but Pete's sensibility, and also the artist had already worked with him and had loved what he did. And I listened to it, and I had zero notes. And the artist uh, approached me and said, do you have any notes? And I said, no, I just absolutely loved it. And it seemed to me if I... And the artist... Agreed, but I've been in these situations where the artist then presents, you know, 50 notes to a mastering engineer. And I'm just thinking to myself, either it wasn't right at the mix stage or you've got the wrong person to master it. Um, there, it's, it's, a, it's a thing I encounter all the time. And I think with a lot of people coming up, and this is a really good topic for conversation, when you're coming up and people are choosing you on budget and availability, before they're choosing you on the character that you bring to a project, as you as you put it so well, individualism. If they're not choosing you based on that, then yes, it's going to be a lot of these kind of questions that people are asking are going to be what people are actually facing on a day-to-day -day. because they want Crystal Algae to mix their song, but they come to you because you're only charging $25 an hour and um, and you're available. So you might only charge them $250 to mix a song that would cost, you know, 20 times the amount if they got this other person to mix it. However, they want you to sound like Crystal Algae or they want you to sound like a particular record. Here's the record they hand you and say, make my recording, which is not recorded in the same way as this record, but make my mix sound like it was this. Um, so these are two very, very different points, I think, um, that we have to really clearly delineate. Um, it, and it's tough when you're up and coming. I'm sure you understand, Matt, when somebody presents you with a finished record and says, make my mix sound like this. Yeah. You know, being able to communicate to an artist when say, well, you didn't record it like this. You want death metal and you're giving me a folk record. You know, I mean, that's an extreme example, but that's pretty much what happens. No, but that, that happens, though. That happens yeah. a lot. Um, you know, a lot of the times, like when I was in maybe my third or fourth year around like 2010-ish, I was very, very frequently get, being given references of Serban mixes because Serban was like the guy. I mean, he's still fantastic and he's still the guy, but like 2010 was like that range of years. He was just everything. And so people were saying, do it like this, do it like this, do it like this. And I was in a place where I couldn't say no to that because when you're in that middle phase, you know, and I, I still kind of think of myself as being in a middle phase, but I'm kind of in like the later end of a middle phase. When you're in like the middle, middle phase, or early middle phase, you don't really have the luxury of being able to lose gigs because you're fighting for every gig that you can get. And so you're trying to constantly make clients happy. And on top of that, you know, you don't have as many years. You do, you know, I was in my third or fourth professional year around that, that time. And then I had, you know, maybe about, I don't know, depends on where you draw the line, but maybe about like five years before that, 
of experience. So it's when you compare that to somebody where they're like, make it sound like Serban. I mean, Serban's been making hit records for he like 20 years at that point. So it's it's a very, very stressful and challenging place to be. Uh, so really, but but the mistake is thinking that that's not a good experience to be learning. It is. You just can't kick yourself when you're down when it doesn't work out, because no matter what happens at any point in your career, you're going to find points where these things don't work out. And the more you become better at being you, the more you'll the only reason you'll get kicked out of the lane less often is because you become better at being able to say this is probably not for me because I can't I don't deliver these kinds of results. It's just not in my nature. And, you know, you can give them the fair warning a little bit more easy. So, you know, learning how to survive the, the middle lane is it's it's tough. It's a very tough place to be. Uh, Gerhard is asking a question and he says, um, don't you have to enhance what's there? It's not creating the emotion. It's highlighting it right. And I would say. You know, I've been blessed as a producer and an engineer to have Andy Wallace, Crystal Algy, Michael Brower, Servan Gurnier, Mark Endert, Spike Stent, um, Randy Storb. I'm trying to think. I just keep going. Like every major mixer ever. Yeah, everybody, mixed. everybody I've ever idolized got it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, they've all mixed my material, and all of them took what I did and enhanced it. But what they did is they enhanced it in all kinds of crazy different ways. Uh, Mark Ender is the archetype of just making everything bigger and better. And just you send him something and it just comes back like so expanded. Spike Stent takes it and screws it up in the coolest possible way. You're just like, I never would have distorted that. I can't believe he did. I never would have put a phaser on that and reversed it. I can't believe he did. And Spike's probably the Telling. most one of the most dominant mixers out there. You know, he's he's, he's probably the most the biggest influence on on me. I would say. Yeah, he's pretty freaking amazing, and so all of them are actually putting emotional responses in there. So that is really kind of when it's enhancing. It means that I'm taking something which is I've I've recorded to be something, and then they have enhanced it. Yes, but they've increased the emotion in it it's so i think that's kind of the question is in the answer it's like that is what enhancing is it's not well, just it's not just making it brighter and bigger or boomier and this and the other it really is doing that well there's two layers to it actually there's there's taking what's there mixing in particular is an extension of the production phase. It's the, it's really the refining of the production phase and it allows for a lot of things because you can be very much like just clean up what's there and be straightforward. And sometimes that's exactly what the record needs. And sometimes it's a place where you can even add additional production or even background vocals or things like that. I've, I've, you know, you can be very transformative in the mixing phase. So yes, you want to enhance what's there, but if if uh, you look at the comments in the the YouTube trailer for mixing with emotion that you put up, you know there were a number of people who said that the way that I was affecting the intro vocals with my very transformative effects, they were saying, you know, I liked it better when it was just raw and straight to the point. To me, it felt, you know, to to them, it felt more honest that way. And so the answer to that is yes. Because the, the identification of the emotion is really the key to whether or not somebody's going to gravitate toward what you're doing. Because we're all going to hear records differently and we're all going to have our own ways of enhancing those expressions. It's also important to note that sometimes music is not like language. Music plays to our lizard brain a little bit more where you can have complex emotions that are contrasting and directly anathema to them. You know, you can have a happy song about a funeral and it will make perfect sense in music and wouldn't make sense in writing. So in the fourth module, which is about anger, I, I felt that anger was a very straightforward emotion because we usually think of things that are very obvious. You beat them to death with the sound, basically make it aggressive distortion, upper mids, you know, I, I don't think that I needed to explain that. So I took it in a more interesting direction with a record that did not sound angry at all, 
but talking to the producer, the producer was saying we wanted to incorporate an element of, of anger into this. And I said, well, this would make for an interesting module incorporating this idea into a record that doesn't inherently sound angry. And where do we take that? Because sometimes we do these things that are very contrarian. And so that made, I think, for the most interesting tutorial and it's the one that I think is the best, in my opinion. So. No, I agree. I agree. Um, you know, I, I, I talk about like sitting in A&R meetings and when you're sitting in A&R meetings, Nobody in that room is talking about frequency response. Nobody's talking about compression ratio. Nobody's talking, you know, about any technical thing whatsoever. And if something sounds good or bad to them, it's never, initially at least, based on, you know, how big or small it sounds coming through the speakers. It's yeah. always about wow, that was exciting, that was cool. You know, those are the words, cool, exciting, uh, um, hip, you know, whatever. Things that a good A&R person, male or female, a good A&R person is one that has an ear of the average listener. Somebody that can hear it and be like, this is cool, this is exciting, this is interesting, this is cutting edge, this is whatever it is, that just to be that jumps out of the speakers and speaks to them. And that seems quite obvious, but it's amazing how many people don't have that skill set. Um, and, and, the, and the ones that do are the ones that are all household names and we know and signed incredible artists. So as professionals on this side of the glass, as producers and engineers and mixers, we have to try and have those ears too. And um, the technical, like we're talking about, is really super important. Um, to get it across the finish line and make it presentable, but it's not the thing that's going to sell the records. No. Obviously, the song and the performance is the most important thing. The song and the performance is always going to be the most important thing. But it is our job, and, and Gerhard, is, uh, Gerhard is, is right. It is enhancement, um, you know, but it can be enhancement emotionally. It can be enhancement in whatever the words, whatever the phrases we want to use to... to to clarify that, um, that's still really our job. I, I'll, I'll give a really straightforward example because it is about enhancement, but sometimes these things have effects that you don't necessarily expect. So I, I got a bunch of um, masters back from Chris Athens and he's one of my favorite mastering engineers. I only had really, I think two notes over the entire album. And one of the notes was for a record that kind of was supposed to have this sort of laid back sort of feel and it felt tense when the master came back. And I could identify technically what I believed was making that tension occur, but I didn't actually know what he had did. So when I wrote back to him, I didn't tell him, you know, do this, do that, do this with technical terminology. I said, there's something in here that's making the record feel tense. Perhaps there's some kind of a, a, a slower compression happening before the limiter that's doing that maybe. And so, you know, my brain does always marry the emotional with the technical because that is really my job. But when I'm giving that note, it's I'm trying to listen on the level of like what's happening to the experience of the record and then let them figure out what it is that's technically causing that and then allow it. And when I got it back, it sounded more relaxed. So, yeah, it's enhancing, but it's 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 a little bit more than I think just, OK, it's what's there and therefore we just make it bigger, you know? Right, absolutely. Russell said, uh, why is it a bad sign to receive notes from the artist before starting to mix a project? I know what I think of that, but... Well, it is it is and it isn't. It's not a bad sign if, if you're talking about the direction of a record. But when you start getting bullet point notes, what's really happening is, is the artist is mixing the record in their head before they're giving it to you. And if they're doing it, my feeling is, is maybe just do that as part of the production phase. If there's specific sounds that you're hearing in your head, don't wait for me to do it, or at least make sure that the, you're attending the session because there's, there's very specific things that you want. The other thing too is, is that when you do that, you don't give the person you're working with the liberty to experience the record for themselves. They lose their objectivity before you even give them the record. And one of the things that's really important when hiring other people is the objectivity that they haven't heard the record. They're gonna experience it for the first time and that's going to give them a fresh perspective on things. 
Uh, and I would say every time I've done a bad mix, it's probably been, well, not every time, but I'd say every time I've gotten those kinds of notes specifically, I've done a bad mix. The one that I wasn't happy with and the artist also wasn't happy with. I'll give you a, a really quick example. I remember one where the artist said, do not do any sample augmentation with our snare, no sample augmentation or replacement. Uh, but we love what you did with this Maya Vic record. Uh, the snare sound was perfect. I replaced the snare on that record with my own snare. So that's the point. It's the artist thinking that they understand what you're doing better than you do and trying to micromanage your job. The artist should have a better understanding of what they do. And then your job is to conform to that, to find your way of fitting within their mold and their vision. But it's not, you're not, you can't be an artist and have somebody hold your hand while you're trying to paint. You know what I mean? Yeah, somebody yeah. that can't say, yeah, give me a self portrait and then run around the side of the canvas and be like, use this brush. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I've got very strong opinions on this as well. Um, you, you know, I remember my first um, big manager I had was Sandy Roberton, who's still uh, one of the biggest managers in the business. And I think he was like the original sort of producer manager, at least one of the, first guys and he said to me whenever you're being interviewed um and there's gonna be a reason why i mentioned this you're being interviewed at the moment he said remember that you're not you're not talking you're not talking to like the average person you're talking to your clients and the problem with that is you get these interviews and i watch quite a few of them and I listen to a producer or an engineer say the things that he wants the artists who are watching to hear. Like I remember, I won't say who it is, but I remember working with this one producer as, as a younger artist and reading interviews with him in like Sound on Sound or Mix or whatever it was. And just thinking, oh my God, I've got to work with this artist, this manager, because, um, sorry, this producer, because the producer was saying things like, it's all about the artist's vision. And I, 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 I just morphed myself to be whatever they view. And, you know, and so as a young artist myself, I was like, I've got to work with this producer. So, of course, I go in and work with this producer. And instead, it wasn't like that. It was all about, like, I've got six weeks to make a record. I'm getting paid a huge amount of money. I need to deliver it finished and mixed in this TM. So he's just like, this is the way it is. This is the drum sound. This is the guitar sound. And I'm like, wait, there, where's the producer that I read in the magazine that was just like, I just want to. And you realize that he was selling himself to his client base in this interview he wasn't really being truthful and honest about it and i think a lot of the time when i read some of these questions that's because people are so used to to not getting a kind of an, an honest kind of answer you know to this stuff i think the reality is is it's our job to get what we can out of the artist um get out get something incredible out of the performance get something amazing and sometimes that is taking risks because unless you can show somebody a vision of what you see and hear how can you have a discussion and i think that you, um russell i think matt's point is if if the artist has always got very fixed ideas um and like matt is saying and it's he's they're mixing it in their heads i um, mean how can you how can you over up and it's, how can you enhance and create something that might take them to a totally different place um yeah this is a, it's a big 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 conversation and i i i do wonder whether a lot of the mumbo jumbo over the years like i i, I know there's a lot of I remember somebody sent me a video where a famous mixer was talking about how they set their bus compressor to be perfectly in time with the groove of the song. And I was like, well, how does that work when there's a 16th note? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's great if the song is just... Yeah. As soon as it goes, then the release time and the attack time just changed and everything's thrown off. It's like, there's a lot of like, kind of like, hey man, I'm going to like, you know, I just feel it, man. And it's like, it's... <laughs> What's funny is I do usually set my compressor in a way that actually grooves with the song. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But, but yeah, you, when you get certain notes, it'll throw it off. Yeah, it, sure. it, it, it can't be magic. It, yeah. There is, there's a, there's, there's work that goes into this. Some technical, I want to lead some, of the, some great questions, but Karen, sorry. I was going to say, there's a couple other sticking points too, which is, first of all, you can't fight your own aesthetic. You know, if you hear something and you don't like it, you're not going to be able to force your way through hearing something that you don't want to hear. That's just a point where it becomes, you know, maybe you're not the right person for the job. Uh, the other thing is, is that, uh, uh, 
gosh, I feel like I just lost my train of thought. Uh, oh, that is one, just because somebody hears something in their head doesn't mean that that's what you have in front of you. So if, you know, somebody sends you, I got a vocal in that was recorded on a laptop microphone in, in a hotel room. And I, right away, the first thing I said to the artist was like, you know, there's a very, very good chance I'm not going to be able to make this sound like a high end recording, but I would be able to do something interesting where I make it sound lo-fi in a cool way. And the artist said, do that. And that, which was nice because, you know, if the artist note was like, make it sound like it was recorded in a very high end thing, it just literally might not be possible. So, you know, it's not that I, I would ever advise fighting the artist or saying the artist is wrong. They're never wrong. The artist is never, ever wrong. They're telling you what they want. What they want can't be wrong. It just might not be something that either A, I can do, or B, is achievable. And that's a different discussion. Yeah, I agree. I agree. One of uh, the best analogy I can think of is when I was uh, when I was in like my teens and early 20s, I remember um, buying a present for somebody that I thought they would like and it being the worst decision ever. It was my cousin. And I remember the next year on her birthday, I bought a kind of blue my Miles Davis, which is obviously one of the greatest jazz albums of all time and one of my favorite albums. And I bought her that. And she was like, this is amazing. I'd never heard this before. And what I realized was I was showing somebody that I respected them and I wanted to include them in what something I thought was great taste. But the year before I had tried to buy something really girly, girly for her. And like some, you know, 20, 21 year old guy trying to buy something girly for a girl you understand what i mean trying to think what somebody else means and, and I, when you when you get like these long notes can be an absolute disaster but if you do what you think is right and what you think is best um it that's i think that's you've got more chance of winning now somebody did talk about um talk about um mixers that like notes now when i work with um one particular mixer, I'll go, go nameless, but on, on, a, on a big record, I remember they said to me, um, the way they overcome this is they mix it so sonically it's balanced, sonically it sounds good in the way that they hear it, but they don't get into too much detail work because they realise that sometimes, very often, if you get into a lot of really, really crazy detail work, you end up undoing it all because the artist hears different versions of that detail work. So they get the song like 90% there, send it off and expect to come back with a lot of notes, which is easier to deal with rather than spending hours and hours and hours on little reverb throws and delay things that people are going to be like, huh? So it's kind of a bit of a balance there. Um, do, you, do you often come across that where you just kind of get it, the basis of the song sounding slamming and it, then see where, where it goes from there? It's so funny. I started doing that over maybe about the last year and my revision process has been so much smoother by trying to expect one revision round as opposed to try and shoot for zero. It, it ends up being one or two consistently as opposed to shooting for zero where it will be anywhere between zero and 10. And I spend a lot less time doing revisions now doing it that way. That's so funny that you say that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, 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 I totally, totally get it. Um, because unfortunately, um, detail stuff can take twice as long as just getting the track slamming. You get the track yeah. slamming, it sounds exciting and all this kind of stuff. And then you spend a couple of hours doing like little tweaks. Oh yeah. One time events take way longer than getting the drum sound for sure. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Uh, Ferdinando says, have you ever been in a situation in which the producer is very detailed with its vibe? He's got a rough mix with a lot of effects and vocoders and crazy effects and then sends you mm -hmm. the raw tracks, hoping you'll do something similar, but better. Mm. How do you do this in this situation? All right. So this, this is like every time I work with EDM producers, because EDM guys, it's like, first of all, their ears are unreal. They'll hear everything to like, to, and the detail is crazy at how good they can hear some of the stuff. But yeah, so I, when, especially when I'm doing anything that's like very heavily electronically influenced, I really encourage people to, to commit the things that they like. And I always use the same phrase. If you like what you send me, you'll love what you get back. And not to worry about whether or not they've overcommitted their ideas and things like that. Because if something's not EQ'd perfectly, it's okay. 
I'll, I'll do some, some EQing that will kind of get it back in the pocket. It, you know, people get this very, very precious about not overdoing things or like, you know, once you commit the EQ is committed, it's like, it's going to be okay. It really is. Yes. Technically the, the phase distortions and things like that, that you can't really hear anyway, they will be there and there isn't really any undoing them. Although if it's minimal phase, technically there is, um, but it's more like you just want to be happy with what you're sending so that, so that there's a very solid basis. Whereas if I'm recreating an effect that somebody already likes, I'm spending a lot of time on something that was already done right the first time, you know, don't, there's no, unless there's something very specific where it's like, I'm trying to do this and the way I've done it isn't correct. Can you please take a stab at it? And I'll say, well, do you have a reference for it? Maybe I can reverse engineer what you were hearing from a different reference, or maybe I can kind of just get the idea of what you were doing and do my own spin on it. And you just need to hear something that's fresh, but that's very nuanced and specific. But otherwise, you know, when the producers ask me, you know, what should I send? Should I just send it dry or should I send it affected? I always say affected, send it affected. If I need something dry, I'll ask for it. Don't worry. Yeah, I think... I, I navigate this the, these kinds of discussions, and I'm sure everybody's hearing this. You know, for me, it's it, it's it's a difficult sort of place because I I relate to all of these things. I relate to the artist perspective, the producer, the mixer. I I see all of these perspectives, and a lot of mixers now, the big guys are asking for the sessions they're asking for the exact way you left the song so that they can then open it up because they'll obviously own every plugin they'll open it up on their computer and then tweak it from there and but still charge an absolute fortune <laughs> and it's 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 an interesting one. So from a producer perspective, when a mixer says to me, send me the last session you did, which isn't always possible for me because if I'm working hybrid, it's like, what do I do? Send them the SSL. You know what I mean? I'm like, you can pull it, pull it up, but it isn't going to sound like the mix because I'm using the compression and EQ on the channels as well as as well as stuff on the bot in the box. Um, and there's a part of you that you have a little bit of a distaste because you're thinking, well, I want you to sort of do some work on this. You are, after all, charging an absolute fortune to mix this song. So there's a bit of that perspective. But then from the mixer perspective, it's like they want to play it safe, to be honest. They want to know that they're starting where you left off and they're enhancing from there. And it's a sort of cultural thing because up until like the early 80s, up until, up until like Bob Clear Mountain really started to become like the dominant mixer in the world and phenomenal mixer, still consider him to probably be the greatest mixer of all time. Um, until like the Bob Clear Mountain kind of like blew this world into like the superstar mixer. Pre that, there was that commitment because what people would do is they'd mix on 20, they'd record on 24 track. You'd pull them up on the fader pretty much at zero, pan it in the right position. And that was the record. That was like how people were recorded. So it's kind of going back to those days where whatever your session is in your DAW is the record. But then we've got the 80s mentality of somebody remixing something or mixing something that enhanced it and took it to a whole new level. So it's a weird kind of place because I'm hearing mixes come back that are like 5% different, but somebody just made thousands of dollars. Do you, but that's, you not, that's not the mixer though. So what's happening there yeah. is that that's, you've now, when you're looking at that situation, you're inserting somebody else into the equation and that's the person who is pressing the yes button on the budget. So yep, a song yep. goes through the label and the label approves it and then they send to mixing. Well, it's like, well, okay, so it's already been approved in this version. So very frequently when somebody is hiring me and it's through label work, I will ask for the session. Uh, preferably the way that I send it out and the way that I would prefer to get it, which I almost never get it, is with the sounds committed and then an inactive version of the raw with the effects. Because I might not have all of the effects. There's new stuff coming out every day. So, you know, and I don't like, I don't have UAD and a lot of people use UAD. So I, you know, generally prefer to have things committed and then be able to open it up underneath. 
Only person who sends that to me is Berna, uh, Pipple's guy. That's it. <laughs> Everybody else, it's all sorts of craziness. But that's the way I send it out when I'm going through label work. If I'm not going through a label, then what I do is I commit the sounds the way that the artist likes it. And I send it with just enough flexibility where I'll have leads. If it's, if it's vocal work, it's just leads, backups, and effects returns. Uh, for leads and backups. So it's only four stems for all the vocals and that's what they get. And that might sound like I'm handcuffing people, but it's really more like, no, this is the sound that the artist already approved. And mixing the concept behind mixing with emotion is not to fight the approval of the artist. It's exactly the opposite. It's, it's to follow that intention as much as possible. So the very last thing too is, is also who cares how much somebody works? If I send a record out to mastering and that mastering engineer decides that the only thing that needs to be done for that record is to slap a limiter on it and call it a day, I'm not, it's not harder to EQ something than it is to not EQ something. It's the same decision process. When your ear is that good and you're that experienced, it's no harder. It's the decision that I'm interested in. So if I get a flat transfer back, that just makes me feel like I did my job really well. It doesn't make me feel like the mastering engineer didn't do theirs. Make it easy. You want to make it easy for the people you're working with. When you're writing string parts or guitar parts, what's going to be better? The part that the, the musician can play their ass off playing or the part that's virtuosic that only other musicians are going to recognize as being virtuosic? No, give them the easier part so that the end listener can enjoy it better. Unless it doesn't work, you know? Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's, it is a team and... and um everybody in that team should be helping each other succeed. Exactly. Um, I agree. I agree. Um, yeah, I agree entirely. It's, it, it's, there's just so much to unbox here on this one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I've been, I remember mastering an album with Bob Ludwig um, and who was phenomenal. And we had um, the two singles, um, most of the album was mixed by one superstar mixer, uh, but two of the singles were remixed by a, another mixer. And we took the majority of the album and tried to match it to the singles. And we had a really hard time because the singles seemed to do everything. They were louder, but more open. It was like, the, the, it, I'll tell you who the, mi the, the mixer was for the singles. It was Mark Endert. And he just seemed to be, it seemed to be louder, without everything feel like it was squared off. It was just yeah. like incredible. And then we took, we tried, then we took the rest of the album and tried to get it as competitive with him as we possibly could. But the way that the other, the rest of the record was mixed much softer without kind of a hardness to it and an aggression to it that really, I'm not talking about high mids, just like, just bit, just big tones. We couldn't get it. So we actually had to take Mark's mix and turn it down, bring yeah. it down. Uh, and, I remember also mastering a record that um, that um, with uh, Stephen um, over at um, what's Stephen's? Can't, I'm banking on his on his company, but anyway, that that um, Mark had mixed, and we didn't do anything to a single song. We sat in the room for like six hours and listened down to every song, and went, "Don't need to add any EQ on this. No compression, no limiting. That's good. Next." We'd listen down two or three times to a track to make sure we weren't crazy. And at the end of it, it was like, it was perfect. So was that uh, a waste of the three grand or whatever we spent on it? No, because we sat there with fresh ears and listened in a great room and realized that Mark Ender is an incredible mixer. And uh, he gave us tracks that were ready to put out. So I, I agree with what you're saying. I, I do agree with what you're saying. Um, I think it's, you know, Joe Ciccarelli, when he said he was working on, um, in his earliest days, in his early 20s, when he was working with Frank Zappa, he goes, it was a different time. People just prided themselves. He goes, you would send a reel of tape and you'd want somebody to pull it up on the console and put it all at zero, pan it around, and it sound like the record. So the next guy who was doing the overdub was like, oh, wow, this Ciccarelli guy is amazing. You know, it wasn't a competition. It was like everybody wanted to be like, I wanted to make sure that you you were impressed by my work, you know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, Drew says, besides a multi-band transient designer, what tools do you use to pull energy 
um, from a two track instrumental, different instruments? That's a tough question because you're kind of locked in there. Um, yeah, I mean, my first weapon of choice is dynamics, you know, transient designer, because most of the time when you're working with a two track, the biggest thing that's getting in the way is the fact that it's been slammed. So, you know, you're chopping off all these transients. It's very hard to fit a vocal into something where there's no room. It's either going to sit above it or below it. If you can open it up, it can sit inside and the vocal can still be prominent. So transient designer or multi and transient designer, depending on the specifics, is my first go-to generally. Now, outside of that, remember, we have dimension that goes three ways. We have our front to back, which is kind of what a transient designer ultimately helps with. But we also have our top to bottom and we have our side to side. EQ typically helps with the top to bottom. When people scoop out mids to make room for vocals, what they're really doing is they're kind of enhancing the lows and the highs to make a pocket for the mid-range that the vocals possess. So you can use EQ. It's just not my first choice to kind of hope to hopefully get things to open a little bit to get a voice in there and get the energy to gel correctly. The other thing that you want to really consider is your mid-side because you might find that you can fit a vocal within a record without having to do nearly as much stuff if you just enhance the side information. And a lot of the times when people make two-track instrumentals, they're usually producers, and producers usually have a good musical sense and decent knowledge of mixing, but aren't necessarily mixers by trade, and where they tend to leave off is things like the reverbs or the power of your pan positions and things like that. So you can get a lot of excitement by working the side information if you're thoughtful and careful. Um, I like the Alicia uh, Plug-in Alliance one, where it allows you to EQ the side bands, but I think there's a lot of plugins that do that as well. Fab Filter does that as well. Uh, EOS's Air EQ does that as well. And you can solo the side and you can hear what's going on there and be like, well, wait a minute, there's all this stuff that's happening in the sides that could be colored up and made more exciting. Um, but that's, that's those are my approaches and usually in that order. Uh, Russell's reposted Mike DeCamp's question. I, I think it says, as a songwriter producing his own work, what best practices would you recommend up front to best imbue, capture at pre-production or performance stage? I mean, for me, whatever's recorded is where you need to get it. I mean, if you did it on pre-production and that's not, and it, that was the best performance, that was the best it was ever going to be, then that should be what it's used. I mean, that's more a, for me, I think these days, uh, if I'm writing a song from scratch, I'm recording at all times and quite often, especially on work that you're getting in like pop, dance music, hip hop. I mean, the production's going down as the song's being written probably 90% of the time, yeah? I, I Yeah, it depends on the project. For, for the pop and hip hop stuff, a lot of the times it's literally being created as it's being created. And it's a very different workflow <laughs> because a lot of the music is being created synthetically. It's being done in Fruity Loops or Ableton or something like that. So it's a it's a very different vibe, um, but I'm I'm still with you actually on the always. You know, people will buy equipment, low budget equipment for like demos, et cetera. But my feeling is is that if you're buying equipment for demos, you want to be buying equipment where you're going to be able to get something where maybe it's not the most high end thing in the world, but it's going to be at least good enough where if there's magic in the takes that you're doing as you're creating the ideas that those takes can be used because sometimes you do something in a demo that just really, for whatever reason, can't be recreated. Um, could, could, could you read the original question the one more time, just so I don't get way too off track? Well, it says, uh, best practices would you recommend upfront to best in view capture at pre-production or performance stage? Okay. So I would also say, since you are the songwriter and the producer, at the same time, you want to have your final vision in mind as early as you can get it. And that comes just from practice, from making records, lots of records and doing the process again and again. But the more you can think about, you know, without get, letting your brain get in the way of the writing process, because that's a big part of it, but the more that you can be writing an idea down or coming up with a concept or a lick or whatever it is, and then hear what that would sound like in the final version. You hear the instrument, 
that you're going to choose to play your riff on. You hear the the kind of reverb and the kind of tone that that instrument might have, and then how other elements start to support it, not just musically, but also sonically. As you start imbuing that into your early writing process, you'll find that going from point A to point Z becomes very smooth and also very enjoyable. But I, 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 I wish there was one thing that I could give you that would magically make that happen, but I think the only thing, the reality of it is just experience and practice. Just keep doing it. Yeah, I think ABR, always be recording. Um, always be recording. Um, I can't tell you how many times the best. I mean, I, I do that songwriting stage. I, I wrote a song with um, um, Mute Math, uh, with Paul from Mute Math, and I had acoustic guitar, he was sitting at piano, and I came up with this melody, and we worked out the chords, I came up with the melody, and he went away that evening, came back with some lyrics the next day. And he um, he had changed the, um, the phrasing on the melody, um, kept the melody, I don't know what the melody was, top of my head, but let's just say it was ba-da-da-da. <laughs> about it whatever he had done da 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 you know what i mean he had kept the me melodic structure but he had moved the the rhythmic aspect of it and it had lost its hook so i'd said to him you know this is the keith richards thing it's something i'd learned in person working with stephen tyler is that th keith richards talks about it in the songwriting book is like that rhythmic component to the melody is just as important as the melody itself so you need to structure the lyric around it and what often happens when you're not recording all of the time and capturing ideas is that you walk away and you forget components of it and you might forget the component of the rhythm you know if it's you know think of walk this way you know you know that 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 rhythm is as important as the melody instead of going ba 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 it could just went ba 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 you change that rhythm with a slightly different swing you get the hamster dance yeah exactly so it's super super important to always be recording always capture ideas so that you don't lose track of something that's inherently um could be the most important part of it i watched stephen in a um with the song it ended up being called street jesus it originally was called sweet jesus um i watched him take the 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 live recording that we had done in boston go back to that like nine months before take that away i did a bounce of it for him and he ended up writing the lyrics phonetically to match the sounds that he was coming up with so he would like e r o or all of these phonetical things. He then wrote the lyric to phonetically work about it, and that was like total perfectioning. Keith Richards talk about that the the phonetics of something. So I think it's a bit. I'm a bit one of my famous tangents, but my point is is like none of that would have been capable if they weren't recording at all times and capturing ideas. They wouldn't be able to take what was initially hooky about it, lose elements of that, but suddenly you lose the phonetics, then you lose the rhythm. And then before you know it, maybe the melody softens out and then you end up with a generic version of an initially really remarkably good idea. So always be recording. I, I was working with a drummer once and the rhythm was something that he, we, he was just messing around. We were recording, but you know, coming up with parts and things like that. And the part was something like, right so in that moment i was kind of like wouldn't it be cool since you have this kick drum doing pop 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 instead of doing it all just on the kick drum just do one kick drum hit and he's like well that's going to kind of screw things up i was like but wait there's more so I grabbed the little pcm and just set it and was hitting mute with him so he was going pop and then i was hitting the pcm so it was going pop pop so the delay created the kick rhythm and it created a completely different tone and effect to it. And it felt very different because pop, pop, pop on the kick feels very aggressive and assertive. Whereas pop, pop, pop that kind of a tail, it has a, t it feels more like almost mysterious or open in a certain way because of the dynamic of it, the change of the tone, that open space that it leaves between the first kick. It like still kind of leaves the open space between the first kick and then that cha cha cha, -cha at the end that fills it up. So it was like, that was part of the writing process. That, that concept was, that's a mix effect, but it's part of the writing. And so that's kind of like, 
sort of what I mean. And that's, I mean, that's a very on the nose example, but like, that's kind of what I'm suggesting. Right. Right. No, I totally understand. Totally understand. It's, I'm looking for some good questions. Um, uh, Sheila says, have you ever turned down a mix? In fact, a couple of people have uh, this, this question, a version of this question. So I'll ask this with Sheila's and it was somebody earlier. Somebody said, have you ever turned down a mix from a major artist because it wasn't ready? Have I ever turned down a mix from a major artist because it wasn't ready? Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't. Not from major artists. I've turned down mixes from major artists for other reasons, um, either because I was under the belief that I would never get paid or because the there were complications with some of the people that were involved in the project not because it isn't ready. Um, from indie clients, I, I don't think I've ever turned something down because it isn't ready, but I have suggested that there are perhaps production effects. Actually, that was, wasn't long ago. Somebody sent me something and uh, was asking me about it. And I said, you know, I feel like there's some production stuff that could still go on. And I, I actually haven't heard back from the person. So I'm currently out $3,000, which but I would rather be out the $3,000 than be mixing something that somebody ultimately I don't think would be happy with, or certainly I wouldn't. So, I mean, that kind of stuff happens for sure. Yeah. Oh, I, I had a combative situation where, oh, I don't want to say who it is, but he's quite a well-known punk rock guy. And um, about a few years ago, maybe three or four years ago, he sent me some um, rough mixes or he sent me some mixes. And he said, I've been working with this engineer in New York, and this is the record we've done. And I really would like some fresh ears to mix these songs better. And it was an artist I'd worked with years before, and they've got a great back catalog of great records and really knows their stuff. And uh, the songs were great. Mixes were pretty good, um, but definitely needed some work. So I said, OK, um, copy me to your engineer and have him upload the tracks to me. And let's start with whatever song it was. So I get copy to the uh, the engineer. He sends back the tracks, and like there's no room mics, um, and yet the drums have rooms, and there is um, uh, the guitars sound thinner, and it's not just EQ and all this kind of stuff. So I write back to the artist and say, "Yeah, I'm not getting a good feeling from this." Um, so what do you mean? I was like, you know, if people are sending me like pieces of the mix you know, elements that are missing, you know, because I, I, and I went to the engineer and, oh no, that's everything, you know. And uh, of course the artist is like, oh yeah, there was room mics. I remember him throwing room mics. Oh yeah, we double mic the cabs. In fact, we had this other cab and it was getting mic'd and we were blending that back in. And I think I went two or three more times trying to get all of the missing pieces of the puzzle. And I realized that this engineer was all, his nose was bent out of shape that, you know, uh, that the artist wanted somebody else to mix and not them. So he wasn't supplying me with everything. Mm. And I, I had to walk away. And it was a big, a very credible, a very cool um, punk rock artist that I had a lot of respect for. And uh, he's, and, and the artist actually started defending the guy. Oh yeah, I'm sure he's sending you everything. And I'm like, it's not, it's not, I don't have everything, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And I just said, I'm, I, you know, this is the first song and I, I don't want to be doing this over 10 songs on a record and spend a month yeah. mixing something. And so I've definitely turned that down. And it was a bummer because it was a, a, a really good sounding project. Um, I can't remember if it ever came out, but um, so there's a little bit of that. And it kind of goes back to that sort of combative thing, how you want everybody to be a team and helping each yeah. other out. I, I did have it happen, actually. This wasn't me turning it down. I took the mix and it, the mix was really one of the best mixes I had done and it's still a great mix. It still holds up, even though this is a long time ago, uh, but it got flat rejected. And I, I did not understand why, because I was so proud of the mix and that, that doesn't tend to happen. Uh, and then when I heard the version that came out, there were all sorts of different elements that I had not been provided. And I realized it was the tracking engineer did not send me everything. And the tracking engineer was the one who did the mix that came out. I was like, Oh, I, I got stabbed in the back. That sucks. Um, yeah, that kind of stuff happens. But I think just in general, I don't typically turn down work unless there's like a very glaring reason to. Uh, but I can see myself doing that for, for the reasons that you described. In that situation, I'd do the same thing. I just don't believe I've had that situation come up yet. Yet. <laughs> um, do 
do you use high pass filters when doing an effects on like delays on a kick? Would you have high passed that? Uh, so the PCM in that particular case already had a certain tone to it. It kind of like this, like slightly watery tone just because of how out of whack the modulation was or whatever it is. Uh, but absolutely. Yeah. I, I would say, depending on the kind of structuring that you wanted, if you high pass the kick, it's going to sound more like a percussion. If you low pass the kick, it's going to kind of sound more like a reverb talking about the delays. Uh, it just depends on that that the effect that you want to go for. If you want to open up space in the bottom end and let it breathe, yeah, I pass it, absolutely. And more importantly, experiment with it. If you have that question and you have that thought process, experiment with it and see what happens. Experiment with the slope of the filter and see what happens because you might start getting things. And this is really the bigger part about the why to kind of tie it back full circle here. The why, the how creates a blueprint. When you follow a blueprint, you build a structure that's already been created by somebody else. But when you ask the why question, it leaves things a lot more open to interpretation. I'm much, much more interested in teaching people how to be better at being themselves than how to do what I'm already doing. Because I don't think I'm that interesting at the end of the day. I think that the most interesting people are going to be the ones who learn how to do something unique and do it very well. So that's... When you have those kinds of questions, get into the DAW and answer that question yourself and find something that maybe I don't have in my arsenal and other people don't have in their arsenal. And now it's yours and you've got it and it's you. you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's a great answer. Christopher Thompson says, um, do you ever go as far as to rearrange a track during the mix process without prior discussion with artist or producer? Not without prior discussion. Um, well, actually, wait. Let me take that back. Yes, I have done that before. Sometimes I will make an alternative arrangement after I've done the mix. I, uh, I had the prior discussion on this one, but I did that with a record that was sent to me recently where the verse was a 16 bar verse, which is, this was a hip hop record uh, and it felt long. So I took the first four bars with the music and I moved it into the intro. And so the first four bars of the verse became a small intro verse and then went into the chorus and then went into a 12 bar verse. And I sent that version and that's the version that's going to get pressed. Uh, but I, I had mentioned that I wanted to experiment with some arrangement changes and he's, he gave me the green light. Uh, but I have done it where I've provided two different versions. Uh, I think this probably have to be the next question. I have a session at one. So I need to get ready for that session, but I can probably do like one more question. Yeah, totally. I think just to quickly add to what Matt's saying, I think it that the answer to that question would be for me, how dramatic, because you could, you could like do a mute and a reverse or a stutter oh, yeah. effect or something. I, I do all that stuff all the time. Yeah. 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 To me, that's not that's not necessary for a discussion, but if you're talking about rearranging, i.e., you know, bringing a chorus up 16 bars earlier, um, doubling a chorus, uh, removing a bridge, putting the bridge at the end, repeating it, you know, change like actual arrangements, like changing the length of the song and the order of the song. Um, yes, definitely. I agree with Matt. I would either do an alternative. Here's what I think would work and not have a discussion, but send the mix as it was uh, with their arrangement, and then do an alternative. But when it comes to minor rearrangement things like mutes and reverses and things like that, or, or those kinds of tweaks, I'm happy to do those all day because if you don't like it, you just undo it in five seconds. Um, and sometimes, often, people get really excited when they hear those kinds of things. And they want that. They want the creativity. Um, how do you motivate yourself to perform a great mix when the performance you sent just aren't that good? So this is this is actually a few people have asked a version of this question. So I think the version of the question is, is like, if it's a paid gig, it's a paid gig, and maybe it's a good artist. So sort of set it up so you're not going to say no because it's well paid and it's a good artist or whatever, but you get the song to mix and you're not really loving it. You don't really like the song because I get asked this question a lot myself. You don't like the song very much. You're not sure if it's necessarily the best performances they could be, but it's a proper paid professional gig. What What, what is your sort of thought process to really kind of elevate and bring your A game to something you maybe don't love? Okay, so this is something that's taken a great deal of maturity. Uh, and it also involves removing yourself from our, our preconceptions of peer pressure and things like that. 
a lot of the times we believe we shouldn't like something before we give something the opportunity. We, we believe that other people won't like it. So we decide we don't like it. Uh, you know, metal people listening to Britney Spears or whatever it might be. Now, mind you, Britney Spears is a fantastic performer. So that's not exactly applicable in this exact question, but I don't, I don't associate with what other people are going to necessarily feel about a song. That's my step one is just not being in that mindset. Step two is just allowing myself to enjoy it and not decide whether or not I like it. The decision about whether or not you like it is very final. So as soon as you've decided, I don't like this song, you can never like the song. So try not to make those decisions in those terms. Just try to allow the song to occur. And sometimes the song is ridiculous. It's poorly performed. It doesn't make any sense, you know, but sometimes those records become very popular record. There's, there was a rapper named Blueface who was popular for a minute, who literally sounded like he was rapping while falling down a flight of steps. His flow was so off kilter and crazy. It, it was just totally bizarre, but the record still became popular. And the thing is, is you don't know why a record is going to take off or what people are going to necessarily hear from it, but you just have to do your best. So I, I try not to tell myself whether or not I like a record and, and just allow the record to be what it is and make the best of it and find the enjoyment in that record. Even if it's ridiculous, if it's ridiculous, then enjoy the ridiculousness of it because people might, re I just did a record like that. And I'm telling you right now, this record is going to be a smash. It is absolutely ridiculous, but it is fun. It's fun. And there is going to be so much hate for it in the comment sections and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, the record, it's stupid. It's fun. It's got exciting ideas that come out of left field for no reason. And I guarantee you people are going to like it. So just don't, don't get into the mindset of disliking something like the process. Enjoy the process. You can always enjoy the process. Yeah, I always bring myself to it. I can't remember the last time I mixed something I didn't like. And that, that, that sounds like such a ridiculous thing to say. But what I mean is like, I always end up liking it. People say, I've got, a, me, I've got a record I don't like right now, but I'm going to find the I'm going to find it. <laughs> you're going to, you're going you're yeah. to find something. You're going to, you're going to make it into something that's interesting and exciting yes. and do something with it. Yeah. I, yeah. And I can think of like stuff that's sent to me, even when I'm working with artists that aren't necessarily as talented as you want them to be, I'm like, that's my job. My yeah. job is to get every ounce, squeeze every ounce of, 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 of artistry and excitement and interest or whatever, you, add superlative, whatever you want to do. That's my job. If I'm producing and that, writing with somebody. That's, that, that's the ultimate answer. That's your job, that's baby. Job. If job. it was perfect, if it was perfect, they wouldn't be hiring you. Yeah. You wouldn't have a reason. <laughs> Yeah. Warren, I got to step out and I got to get right. myself ready for the session. Thank you so much for having Thank me. Thank you, on. everybody. Check out there's a, um, there's at the top of the stream, you'll see a link to Matt's course, but there's also um, Eric just put it up as well just now. Please check out his course. It's pretty awesome. Um, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Um, that was a lot of fun. Let's do another yeah. one soon. I'm always down. Let's do another one. This is a lot of fun to do. Thanks, everyone who tuned in. So long. Farewell. Au revoir. Adios. Adio. Ciao. Um, Tootsins. Goodbye. You got two of me? Got two of you on the screen. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. You all rock.